Our scripture reading this morning is, as I mentioned at the outset again, from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 4 to 8. So if you have a Bible and you want to open it, that's where you would turn. If you don't have a Bible and you want to use one of the blue uh, Bibles that are in the chair racks, then Acts 8 is on page 1165. Uh, We started this new teaching series last week, and it's going to take us through five chapters in the book of Acts, starting at chapter 8 and going through chapter 12. And The book of Acts is sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles, but the guy that we come to today, the the first cross-cultural missionary even, you might say, was not an apostle. His name was Philip, and later he's referred to as Philip the Evangelist, and we're going to spend the next three weeks with Philip. So let's, uh, let's read this passage, and let me invite you to stand if you're able, and when I'm done, you'll know I'm done because I'm going to make the statement, this is God's Word. And when I do that, I'm going to invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. So Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 4, reading through verse 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. This is God's Word. Please be seated. So I said and told you that Philip was later referred to in the history of the church and referenced in the book of Acts as an evangelist, Philip the evangelist. Now the word evangelist has actually fallen on rather hard times in the popular culture. It has a, a negative connotation at its, at its very worst. Maybe that's you. Maybe you hear the term evangelist and your initial reaction is, is almost to cringe because your brain subconsciously sort of translates that into an image of a televangelist or, or something like that. You know, one of those people you used to see flipping through the channels on TV back when most people flipped through channels on, on TV. And and, and you kind of see it like that. Or maybe you think of someone like a, you know, like a door-to-door salesman, you know, someone you don't really want to, to talk to because they know all the sales, slick sales tricks, and they seem like they have all the answers, and they seem to be just relentless. Maybe it's something like that, and you have a negative idea of that word evangelist when it comes to mind. Or maybe to you, you kind of say, well, that's not fair. That's not how I think of an evangelist. An evangelist is a good thing. Right? That, would be the, that, would be the, that would be the church answer, that would be the Christian answer. But even here, the general tendency, I have to say, in the Christian church, by and large, is to view an evangelist as, a, as, a, as an office holder, or if not an official office holder, at least someone who has received some kind of special gift and commissioned, like a, you know, sort of like a Christian special forces operative or something, like you're an evangelist, now you're trained, go out and, 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 and be an operative. Now, but that's not what we have with Philip. And we just have an ordinary guy who has an extraordinary message and was given an extraordinary opportunity to proclaim the truth about an historical event. And there's three things I want to see in this passage when we read it. We want to see obedience, transformation, and joy. Now, it was Philip's obedience, it was the Samaritan's transformation, and it was everyone's joy. Let's look at each of them. First, let's look at the obedience. Um, Hudson Taylor, you may have heard of him, one of the first Western missionaries of the modern missionary movement to take the message of Jesus to to China. And he tells the story, Hudson Taylor told the story, of uh, of a Chinese pastor who was talking one day with a young man in China who had just become a Christian. This young man had just become a Christian. And the pastor asks this young man if it was true that he had only been following Jesus for three months, if he had been following Jesus for three months. And the young man says, yes, it's it's true. And the pastor followed up and asked, okay, you've been following him for three months. How many people have you told about Jesus? And the young man says, well, look, it's only been three months. I'm, I'm still a learner. I, I just got a copy of the New Testament for the first time yesterday. And the pastor looked at him and he smiled and he said, do you use candles in your home? And the young man said, well, yes, I use candles. And the pastor asked him, do you expect the candle to begin shining only when it is burned halfway down? And the young man said, no, I expect the candle to begin shining into the darkness as soon as it's lit. And the pastor said, exactly. And the young man got the point. 
Now, there is a time, don't get me wrong, for being a learner. But if there is one thing that we get from the book of Acts, it's that God did not intend for the candle to burn halfway down before it began to shine into the darkness. Now, no doubt the church had much to learn. They didn't have a New Testament either at this point. They didn't have all of their theology straight and completely in neat rows. But they had had a personal experience with the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And they had a mandate from Him, motivated, motivated by love, to take that message into the world, to be a light that would shine in the darkness. And Philip was obedient to that command. Now, who was Philip again? Well, he was one of seven Christian men in Jerusalem who had been appointed, you can read about it in Acts chapter 6, appointed to assist the apostles, the official office holders, in distributing food to the widows of the church. It was sort of a, a prototype for what would later become the office of, of a deacon, and Philip was one of them. Philip was also a Hellenist, which meant that he was a Jewish, uh, he was a Jewish convert to Christianity, but his primary language and his primary cultural experience was Greco-Roman. Right, rather than Jewish culture. Now, this, was, this happened because a, lo- a number of Jewish people, remember, though, though, though the Jewish people were concentrated in the region of Judea and anchored by the city of Jerusalem, but for centuries they had not ruled themselves. And throughout the years, various foreign occupations and persecutions had spread the Jewish people throughout the surrounding areas. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's possible, likely in my mind, that many of the Hellenist Christians, those who were primarily Greek-speaking, primarily from a Greek cultural background, they were the ones who were converted on the day of Pentecost. Today, I think, is Pentecost Sunday? Right? Right? They were converts on the day of Pentecost when the Apostle Peter preached to the crowds who had gathered, including, it tells us in Acts chapter 2, Jews who spoke other languages. That being the case, the scattering of Philip and many of the others of these Hellenist Christians was God's way of saying, okay, your visit to Jerusalem is now over. I brought you here for a reason so that you could meet Jesus, but now it's time to go out. And what did Philip do when he did that, when he went out? Well, note that he made a somewhat intentional choice in verse 5 because he went to Samaria, He was one of the scattered, it talks about in verse 4. Now, the scattered probably went in multiple directions, but Philip, it says, it went down to the city of Samaria. Now, some scholars aren't exactly sure what city this was exactly, and and some of the texts even omit that definite article, the, could just say a city of Samaria, but it really doesn't matter. The point is, he went to a city, and the city was a Samaritan city, and it's hard to overstate how big a deal this was how big a deal it would have been for someone who was Jewish to interact with Samaritans. Quick history review so we don't miss the significance here. If you were here during the winter, we talked about the reign of King Solomon in ancient Israel from about 970 to 930 BC. So we're talking almost a thousand years before the book of Acts. That's where we were with the reign of King Solomon. Well, Solomon was the very last king to rule over a united nation of Israel. After him, it all fell apart, and you had 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel split from Judah in the north and, and, and became what, what, is, what became known as Samaria. Well, this breakaway northern kingdom as a separate kingdom, it didn't last particularly long. In 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire conquered the northern kingdom, conquered Israel, and deported thousands of its people out of the land leaving just a remnant there of Jewish heritage. Now, the Assyrians then repopulated the land with foreigners, with Gentiles. And over the centuries, these foreign Gentiles intermarried with the Jewish remnant that was left, and what you had was a people, the Samaritans, who were neither Jewish nor Arab, neither Jewish nor Gentile. They were neither, and they were hated, therefore, by both. And there's a lot more history, a lot more animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans that made the matter even worse. But the scholar Derek Thomas basically says that the Apostle John put it perfectly when he said in John chapter 4, matter-of-factly, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's the bottom line. Now, think about us for a second. What about you? Right? With whom do you have or would you not want to have any dealings? Right? Who might be the modern equivalent for you of the, of the Samaritans, right? Are, it, are there members of a particular community, maybe, who, 
who dress differently, who act differently, who may even act sometimes with hostility toward you. People like that. Are they, the, are they, are they our Samaritans? Right? Are they people who represent the, you know, the, the secular culture who you've been told are the, are the enemy? Are they people who embrace uh, certain lifestyles, certain identities to our, that are contrary to what the Bible teaches and, and, and that you know are ultimately harmful for them? Those are our Samaritans. And yet this is to whom Philip goes. And what does he do when he's there? He proclaims to them the Christ, it says in verse 5. Now, note that he didn't seem to, he didn't seem to have a, like a hip strategy. Didn't seem to have a fancy band. Didn't seem to be leading with a message of Jewish Samaritan reconciliation. That's not how he went in. That's not how he led. His message, it says, was the Christ. Now, it's a, it's a bit simplistic to just leave it there, right? Because he probably, most certainly, sought for some point of cultural connection. Uh, Derek Thomas, a scholar, says he, he thinks he probably he could have very likely started with the Old Testament. That's the Bible that they had. The, the Samaritans did accept the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, and so he could have started, he could have started there. He could have traced Jesus back to the, to the Garden of Eden, the seed of the woman who was promised who would bring an end to the power of sin. He could have traced Jesus back to the promise, who was, the promise that was given to Abraham, right? the descendant of, of Abraham through whom all nations would be blessed. He could have shown them how Jesus was the ultimate exodus, how God was rescuing His people from the slavery of sin just like God had rescued His people from the slavery in Egypt. But one way or another, Philip got to the Christ, the promised Messiah, whom Philip had personally experienced. Now, whatever this means, it means, it, it means this. Philip not only tolerated the Samaritans, Philip loved the Samaritans. Why else tell them the message of how to be saved and how to be reconciled to God? It doesn't mean that he agreed with the Samaritans from their theological starting points. It doesn't mean that he agreed with their worldview at all. But it does mean that he could have chosen to go somewhere else, and he didn't. And it means that while he could have just been scattered and hid among the Samaritans, you know, maybe he did have to go to Samaria. Maybe that was the only route open to him. He still made a choice. He could have just gone to Samaria and kept his head down. I don't know how long I'm going to have to be here. It's pretty hot in Jerusalem. Not sure where I can get out to next. Maybe I'll look for some way to get out of Samaria too. And until then, I'm just going to keep my head down. He could have done that, but he didn't. He loved them enough to proclaim to them the Christ. Can I ask you a question? Why are you in New Jersey? Why are you in New Jersey? Right? I want to guard against a tendency that I think is becoming more prevalent among Christians today, especially those who are, who are rightly and understandably troubled by the rapidly secularizing culture around them. Right? It's, it's, it's a cynicism regarding a fear maybe, even a resentment maybe, of where God has scattered them, about where He's put them. And it leads if allowed to go there, to an approach to ministry and evangelism that thinks that you can only really proclaim the Christ, it can only really be done if you're among people like you, in whatever state you think people like you live. The Samaritans were not people like Philip. Right? See, it's, it's easy to joke about how the culture around us is hostile, and it can be about how the culture around us is getting even more hostile. And it may be. It's easy to joke about that. And the only responses that we sometimes have are either seek to leave or, as long as you're here, put your head down as, as much as you can and tolerate it. But what if we viewed us being here as a divinely orchestrated act of God? The God who Paul told us about when he was talking to the Athenians in Mars Hill in Acts 17, the God who has determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of the dwelling place for every person. Right? What if being in New Jersey was not an accident or a mistake to be corrected, but an opportunity to be embraced? Right? If you're from here originally, then you know the area, you know the culture. What an advantage. 
If God has brought you here from a different place, do you think that was an accident? Do you think that was a mistake? Why did Philip go to the city in Samaria? Presumably because that's where the people were. We live in the state with the highest population density of any state in the country. More people per square mile in the state of New Jersey than any other state. And you have the message of eternal life, transformative hope, and unshakable joy that comes only through Jesus. You have the Christ. Now, that message may not take root in every person, might not even take root in most people. But for those who are obedient to the command, point number one, the commandment to proclaim the message, we get to be front row participants in the transformation, point number two, that results. That's what we see in verses six and seven. The people were captivated, it says, by the message. They, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. That's what it says in verse six. And they were convinced that, that, that what was being said was true. That's what the signs are, are, are all about, the healings, the freeing from demons in verses 6 and 7. Like with the apostles, the Holy Spirit's power worked through Philip to do these things as a confirmation of the words that he was saying. It was a seal of, of authenticity. And it showed, it was intended to show that Jesus was ruler over all things. He was ruler over the physical realm. He was ruler over the supernatural realm. Everything bows before his authority, and he can be trusted. Now, the question inevitably comes up in the book of Acts, should we expect this kind of thing to continue today? The accompanying of the preaching of the gospel and its acceptance with dramatic signs and and miracles. And we don't have time to look at it in depth, but the short answer is, I don't believe we should expect this to be the case, at least normatively. And the main reason is that these things were used in the first century church to authenticate the teaching of the apostles, to demonstrate that what they were saying was true and that it could be trusted. They didn't have, as we say, as we said already, they didn't have the New Testament scriptures in their hands. They didn't have authoritative documents to be able to point people to. And so the message of the apostles was authenticated by the performance of these signs. Well, we have the Bible today. It has been authenticated. And so the apostolic era and the miraculous signs that were necessary to accompany their teaching are not normative in our age. But that doesn't mean that the preaching of the gospel message doesn't still transform and change people and cultures where it's proclaimed and where it's believed. This room is filled with people who have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, by miracles of the Holy Spirit that have led them from destruction to eternal life because of what Jesus has done, because of the miraculous intervention of God in their lives and taking control and taking rule over all aspects of it. Every time someone believes in Jesus... They are rescued from the power of what has previously blinded them to the truth. And and, and every time someone believes in Jesus, they are given the promise of a future where healing, including a physical healing, is guaranteed not just to the select few who happened to stumble upon Philip the evangelist in the first century. Every Christian has the promise of real eternal healing. You don't just have to have stumbled upon an apostle someday who did a miracle. Every Christian has that promise. And and bring this back to us for a second. Wherever, Wherever you are scattered, you have the opportunity to tell that message to someone and to offer them that that kind of hope. If you think the culture today, if you if you think the culture, the schools, the families, the, the communities among us, if you think they need transformation, then you are the ones, the only ones, with the only message that you can bring that has the power to transform not just the physical, but the spiritual as well. Not just the now, but the eternal. And this is not just a job for the adults. Right? Last week I said that all of us have been scattered into different places to work, you know, hospitals and stores and offices and places like that. But kids, I want you to, kids, I want you to listen for a second. I want you to listen for a second to this, to this story. Right? There was a man whose name was Kennedy Smart. He was a pastor, Presbyterian pastor years ago. Imagine that. Isn't that, isn't that a, is that not a cool name? Imagine getting to be called Pastor Smart. Right? 
Well, Kennedy Smart was a leader in our denomination. That's the big group of churches that, that, that formed together to work together to, to spread the gospel across the country. And Kennedy Smart, Pastor Smart, used to travel around. He used to travel to, to different churches and teach them how they can do better, how they could do better at telling people about Jesus. He was a trainer of evangelism. He did that. Well, a few years ago, a friend of mine heard Kennedy Smart tell the story when, about when he learned the most about who God uses to build his church, right? And it wasn't the adults. Kids, listen to this. Pastor Smart was talking about a time when he was trying to build a new church. He was trying to start a new church, and he had all this training, all this experience about how to tell people about Jesus, and he worked for years and years, but he couldn't get more than about 50 people to come to his church after more than two years of ministry. And then one day, he was talking to a young boy named Max at a local elementary school who Pastor Smart used to help with his homework every week. And Max had a pretty hard life. It wasn't easy for Max. And Max, Max was wondering about whether, whether, whether he was ever going to amount to anything in his life. And Pastor Smart told him about Jesus. And Max believed in Jesus. And the next week, Max brought two of his siblings to church. He didn't wait for his candle to burn halfway down. Max just started telling, he started telling people about Jesus. He started with his family. And he brought his two siblings to church the next week. And he went up to Pastor Smart and he said, hey, do you think, um, do you think I could bring a few more people next week? Because I've invited a few more people to church. And Pastor Smart said, sure, how many, how many do you think? And, and Max stopped as if he was kind of doing mental calculations in his head. And he said, I think it's about, I think it's about 22 so Pastor Smart had to get a bus to bring these kids to church. He ended up bringing, Max ended up bringing, inviting and bringing more than 60 kids to church to hear the gospel. This little boy from elementary school. More than Pastor Smart had been able to get into the doors of the church after two years of ministry. A child had transformed the church because the child, without even thinking about it, had been obedient to let his candle shine in the darkness. And it transformed a pastor who thought he knew everything already about what it meant to share the gospel. The people in this Samaritan city were transformed because a man named Philip had been obedient. And the result, we see in verse 8, is joy. There was much joy in the city, it says in verse 8. Now remember that joy is not pretending that everything in the world is, is always happy. Now, this is what I mean. Right? Not, there, there are sometimes things in the world that are sad, sometimes things that are very sad, and we should be sad when things are sad. Jesus was sad when things were sad. In fact, the Bible says that, describes Jesus as a man of sorrows. He was a man of, of sadness. He knew what that was like. But see, that's not what real joy is when the Bible talks about joy. Joy is what Jesus prayed for his disciples to have before Jesus died, when he was praying for his disciples. He prayed that they would have joy. The old pastor, Donald Barnhouse, says that joy is the steady, the steady tenor of our being and the calm beneath the, the rough seas of the ocean. Right, today would be a beautiful day for it, but the next time that you're, you're down by the, by the ocean, right, we're just a couple of miles from the Atlantic Ocean, the next time you look out over the Atlantic Ocean, there has never been a storm, Barnhouse said, there has never been a storm whose roots go deeper than the surface. A submarine, he says, always finds the water 50 feet down as calm as a pond on a clear June day. Joy is when the abiding calm down deep is there and recognized even when the white caps on the surface are dancing. And joy is what was being experienced in that Samaritan city. And that one little short verse in, ver in verse 8 doesn't elaborate, but I think that joy must have been felt in two categories. All right, there is the joy of the converted. Those who had heard the message of Jesus, those who understood the message of Jesus and believed the message of Jesus. Think of what it must have felt like to be a Samaritan. I already said, no one liked them. They were the outcasts from both sides. They weren't full-blooded Greeks, and so they were corrupted by Jewish blood in the eyes of the Greeks. They weren't full-blooded Jews, and so they were corrupted by Gentile blood in the eyes of the Jews. And, and what was the message, <laughs> and yet what was the message that Philip was proclaiming to them. He was proclaiming to them the Christ. And that is a message that is made for the outcast. A message that is made for the miserable. On, on January 6th, 
1850, a 15-year-old boy named Charles Spurgeon was on his way to church in the midst of a snowstorm, a blizzard. He couldn't make it because of the blizzard. And so he ducked into a small Methodist church that he was passing by for, for shelter. Now, there were only about a dozen people in this church, and there was no minister that day because the snow had kept the minister from coming. And so an untrained man, he wasn't an apostle, an untrained man, a shoemaker or a tailor, Spurgeon recalls, got up to preach. And his text was Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And the man only talked for about 10 minutes. Spurgeon said that's about all he had. <laughs> he had about 10 minutes in him, and that, and, that, and that was it. He didn't have stories. He didn't provide the detailed historical or biblical analysis, but he most certainly could proclaim the Christ. And he said to that small group of a dozen people, many of ye are looking to yourselves, and no one is, no one is going to find anything there. There's no use in looking to yourselves, he says, because you'll never find comfort, joy in yourselves. And then he told the man where to look. He used this text, look unto me and be ye saved. And he applied it this way. He said, look unto me, I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I'm hanging on the cross. Look unto me, I'm dead and I'm buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend, I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. Oh, look to me, look to me. And then the man saw Spurgeon, there was only 12 of them in the room, and he called him out, this 15-year-old boy, he called him out. He said, young man, you look miserable. Yeah, I mean, there were only 12 people, he couldn't hide. He's like, wait, it's me? You look miserable, he said, and you will always be miserable miserable in life and you will be miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Young man, look to Christ. And Charles Spurgeon later wrote, there and then the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away. And that moment I saw the sun and I could have risen that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. The joy of the converted. But there's also the joy of the evangelist. A contemporary across the ocean of Charles Spurgeon was a man by the name of John Wanamaker. Now, John Wanamaker was different in many ways than Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon became a famous preacher. John Wanamaker became a famous merchant in Philadelphia and in New York. But while Spurgeon would have been considered the professional evangelist, John Wanamaker writes that nothing in his very successful life made him happier, gave him more joy than seeing someone put their faith in Jesus. This is how John Wanamaker put it. He said, if you once, if you just once have the joy and the sweet pleasure of bringing one soul to Christ, you will be hungry to get another. Do not argue. Do not be rebuffed. Be patient and gentle and keep on with a prayer in your heart and drop a good word here and there as you go along. But oh, what pleasure it will be to you to have a newborn soul beside you at the next supper of the Lord. That's what we're going to celebrate right now. Jesus, the the Christ whom Philip proclaimed, instituted this practice and gathered us together, each of us miracles, scattered about and brought together. We sit next to one another and we share together at the supper of the Lord the truth of what Jesus has done for each of us because someone proclaimed the gospel to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God that has transformed and promises to transform and bring joy into our lives as we share this message and as we proclaim it. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful and obedient to your command, that we would see the opportunity that you have placed before us, that we would rejoice in where we are and, where, and what you have given us, and allow us to be able to see you clearly as we proclaim you to others. In Jesus' name, amen.